Fox team wishes you good luck and Godspeed. Space Monkeys blasting off with Braxton Woodham. He is the president of Unfinished Labs. And we just have a few minutes to talk today about everything he's working on. With the Project Liberty, sir, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very nice to have you here. Thank you. Um, now, your project's just kind of coming on the radar within the last few months. Right. Uh, maybe you could just give the community a quick rundown on who you are and how you got wrapped up in the project. Sure. Um, so I've been working in social media for many, many years. My first startup was a social media startup. No way. Um, and it was we were overwhelmed by... Uh, it was a mobile video startup before the iPhone, and we were overwhelmed by the moderation challenges. We were just a torrent of sex, drugs, and violence kind of hit us all at once. We, Our team still has PTSD from that. <laughs> well, wow, okay. Um, and we actually pivoted into uh, the company into being um, an analytics company for the real-time web at the time. Interesting. We processed the full Twitter fire hose. We were first to post pictures into Facebook. So we kind of had a front row seat to the rise of social media. And being a data engineer by, by trade, you know, I realized that there were these massive data structures created kind of by the people for the few. And right. it was increasingly concerning to look at the economic models that ultimately led to the rise of the surveillance economy yeah. and how damaging it's been. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about the need for a protocol, which was not a unique idea. Protocols versus platforms has been around you know, for a long time. Yeah. This was around 2009, 2010. Wow. But the challenge was, you know, most protocols like for the internet or for data in motion, when it's at rest, it's stored in proprietary databases. So how do you get decentralized, you know, databases that are, you know, kind of common, kind of uh, co-op databases or common common databases uh, that aren't controlled by any um, private interest or government? Yeah. So I started looking at Ethereum in 2014 and realized, ah, this this breakthrough with uh, decentralized shared state is exactly the technology we need for this protocol. Yeah. And so um, in 2019, fast forward, I thought the problem now is how do you, how do you um, get the capital for that kind of public interest project? Sure. It's, I've done a lot of venture capital raising in my time, but this is not uh, ideally a venture capital kind of project. Right. And so then I was talking to Frank McCourt, 2019, and he had been thinking about similar problems mm -hmm. and even digging into the tech um, through companies he had created. And he instantly got the idea, and we s said, then let's create a technology group that is um, funded in a way that it's, you know, assume that a lot of the funding will be philanthropic. There might be some commercial activity as well, but start with one group building one tech stack. So we built on Ethereum. Mm -hmm and kind of validated that the protocol connecting different applications to one social graph anchored onto a, a blockchain is feasible. Right. But the scalability and cost of Ethereum was not feasible, and that's yeah. when we started um, our journey into looking at layer one solutions that led to, to frequency. And I, I guess to, I don't like, I'm trying not to go too long here. No, but, sorry, uh, yeah, this is all great. The last, last chapter here was, yeah. we looked at over 30 different chains and you know they're all opt a lot of great technology in the space but a lot of it's optimized for financial transactions hence the explosion of DeFi and nfts yep yeah um we realized that for communications there's just different dynamics there and the way that resources get allocated you know messages uh, or posts are really low in value in the individual level yeah. for the most part but the aggregate value of that is high and so just different dynamics there and so we ultimately concluded the best solution for us or for the project, really, was to build a layer one chain within the Polkadot ecosystem because their unique resource allocation model with their relay chain could then we could then have a layer one chain that then distributes that out uh, for the purpose of messaging capacity in a way that is, is very efficient and predictable. So frequency um, is kind of that layer one solution, right? Yeah, we just did a video on frequency. Uh, very interested to see you guys coming yeah. up. And this protocol that you thought about eight years ago. Uh, as suitable for Ethereum. This is the DSNP, the Decentralized Social Networking Protocol. That's right, and the critical thing about DSNP is if you look at the course of human history, whenever there are economic incentives intersecting with any technology or ecosystem, yeah. 
eventually a smaller group captures that ecosystem right. for their own interests. Okay. So we thought it was critical that the social graph, which is the source backbone of a social network, which is where all these network effects happen, yeah. um, that be public infrastructure. So DSMP is not tied to a particular token or blockchain. Ooh. We look at frequency as like, think about the web. You've got hypertext transfer protocol. You have different web servers. You know, you've got Apache web server, Microsoft IIS, right? We look at frequency like Apache web server. It's one implementation, but we're intentionally not trying to accrue all the power to one economic system. So others right. can build blockchains and tokens that support DSMP as well. Is this why it's a philanthropic pursuit? Because like you can't really monetize a, pr a protocol like that? or That's right. So we've broken out DSMP. It's a separate organization now, dsmp.org. You can go there and see it, learn about that, mm -hmm. building that up. Whereas frequency is um, more like the like parity in the polka dot ecosystem, mm -hmm. you know, tokenized ecosystem gotcha. that needs to be economically sustainable, and that that ecosystem will will contribute to to DSMP and supporting it. We think others might as well. So that's what we look at look at oh. the dynamic. Okay, gotcha. So uh, when you started talking to us today, you're talking about how your initial project, your team was inundated with with sex, violence, and drugs. Yes. Um, how how does what you're building now address that? Are we just trying to decentralize uh, the entire protocol so nobody has to worry about it anymore, or or is that still on your mind? Um, these sort of messages going through. Oh, the, the the entire problem set's always on our mind. Yeah. Um, there's no silver bullet. It's so complex. Yeah. So what we've focus on is how do you decompose the problem, mm -hmm. uh, work from first principles, and then build up a solution stack versus one solution. Mm -hmm. And so the first step was uh, pulling the, the core infrastructure, the core data that connects all humans, the, the digital map of all of our relationships, making that part of the fabric of the internet itself as opposed to having it be proprietary within one company. Okay. Is that a good or bad thing? It's kind of universally people have said that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and, the, and then have all the companies then that get created can leverage those network effects that are available to everyone. Okay. Which is, you know, a very different scenario than we see today where if you're in Silicon Valley, where I was for the last decade, the network effects were so strong that most entrepreneurs in consumer would say their goal is just to build a company to get sold to Facebook, Google, Amazon, right. because there's almost no hope of overcoming the network effects mm -hmm. they've accrued. So by changing the landscape this way, we're hoping that will open up innovation around moderation, curation, all these other hard problems. Gotcha, okay, so you guys are just worrying about the infrastructure and then the people who build on top, they have to worry about this stuff. Correct, although we're now actively, we announced a partnership with MeWe. They're gonna be the first network to decentralize on DSMP, so they're actively dealing with those problems today, right? They've got yeah. 20 million members, 600,000 groups, they, ha they deal with all those issues around moderation today. So. We're looking for values-driven um, companies that have have a large community to start coming over and help solve these problems. So we are actively seeing solutions being worked today. So I haven't seen that anywhere. You guys are working with MeWe. MeWe's launching on... DSNP. DSNP. Is that going to be for the launch of Frequency, or are they coming in a little bit after you work out? Well, the Frequency kinks? has to launch as a chain to get and, and establish its chain on-chain governance, like the typical kind yep. of bootstrapping into the... Yeah, kind the of like ecosystem. a six-month process of... Hopefully a less than six months, but a few months. Okay. Um, um, and then once we get it, or really confident, we're ready to layer on real users, then they would be one of the, the first major community that kind of moves over. And yeah. if we, once we have that done, we'll already have the largest decentralized um, social network in the world at that point, that by a large margin. Wild. And then we'll grow from there. So that's okay. why that's an exciting announcement that they are willing to come into this new world, you know. Amazing. Pioneer. Yeah, know. that is wild. Okay, so that's going to be happening on Kusama, which is... A... Uh, we're actually look, looking at Polkadot. Oh, you, yeah. frequency is going right to Polkadot? I think so. Oh, my apologies. It's, You're yeah. going straight to Polkadot. That's the current thinking, yeah. Okay, so what do you what do you think about the twin network idea and, and the Polkadot ecosystem in general? I think this is going to be probably one of the largest user bases launching on Polkadot. It, it, I believe would be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you feel about the, the general ecosystem and kind of plugging into it now? Are you going to be leveraging any of the other chains, or are you guys mostly just focused on your own core? We're big believers in interoperability. Mm -hmm. we, we, we look at um, you know, technology. We're hoping it evolves into this idea of a, a, called a quilting bee, 
as opposed to one company tries to dominate and gr build a massive workforce and then build a bunch of products. Yeah. We all just have our little square and it's more decentralized, right? Nobody runs the quilting bee. Somebody might host it at their home, but they don't really direct anybody. Everybody does their own thing on their own square. Yeah. But they all fit together and create this quilt. So we're, we're looking at that same approach. So um, we actually hosted a summit here with our conference on Wednesday, we call Day Zero. We invited parachain leaders to come in. We had five or six that came this time. We're hoping to have it grow mm -hmm. to talk about interoperability, how we work together, mm -hmm. and all this. So we're, we're definitely very um, interested in hooking all this together um, as, as a larger fabric in the ecosystem. Awesome. Um, when this is all running smoothly, uh, maybe in a few years here, what are your hopes of how this is going to influence the, the course of humanity and change some of the problems that we're experiencing today? Well, we're really hoping that we can move as fast as possible past this issue of uh, the surveillance economy that drives so much polarization. Because yeah. you have this bad cycle of you need to drive engagement to drive profits from advertising. To drive engagement, you trigger people emotionally, and to trigger them, yeah. you have this inflammatory content that gets propagated. Yeah. And it just—we've watched it now bleed into our reality. It's not just a digital problem; it's a—it's a problem that is bleeding throughout the analog world or meat space. Yeah. And so we're—we're we're looking at, um, you know, the 24 presidential election as a milestone. Even we're trying to move very urgently, and that's why we feel like the move. There's two things I would say. One, we all need to contribute to Web3 being something that works for society, not just a way to like Web2 all over again, making money for a few clever tech people. Yeah. And number two, uh, we really believe that we need to take advantage of this m moment of transition uh, to fight back against authoritarian regimes, whether they're sure. uh, analog or digital, right. as fast as we can. So why, why would these data oligarchs ever give up their power? Like, why would, why would Twitter ever come over to a decentralized platform? It's a great question, and we don't know that that will happen willingly. We're assuming it's going to be a very difficult uh, challenge, and so we've been asking people when they come in to be willing to take on the fight. That there's going to be a lot of a lot of challenge to, to what's what's happening here because a lot of sure. people have a lot of um, resources at stake right behind this. So mm -hmm. we see a lot of a lot of conflict. That said, to move fast, we think we need a, a migration, not an not an adoption strategy, but a migration strategy. And so maybe as an example, of that instead of trying to go put out apps and get users individuals to download an app, sign up one by one, which eventually will, we, we hope will happen. We need to have entire communities migrating like, like we're doing with MeWe, where we show, meet them where they are right? Uh, in, the, in the chunks of tens of, and you know, ultimately hundreds of millions to get to the scale we need to kind of change the dynamic. You know? Amazing. Are, are the users of MeWe even going to know that, that they're moving over? Uh, well, there's two parts to that. I think one, intellectually, it's really important. Obviously, this whole ecosystem is about transparency, and we've already been communicating with the MeWe has been communicating to their members. Uh, they call their users members. Yeah. Um, they already have a group. If you go to uh, I think MeWe.com/web3, I believe there's a community already building quickly to talk about the free groups, talk about decentralization of MeWe, and so their 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 own community is very participatory mm -hmm. in what it means and helping to infuse the thinking of the roadmap that they have. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we don't drive that roadmap. We're focused on infrastructure, right? Uh, but they're engaged that way. At the same time, on the user experience side, the hope is it's very seamless. We're just hoping, you know, you're already using this iOS or Android app for your communications. Now you have a digital wallet that shows up in that app. You can opt into using it. It's very clear. It's not some Web to like fine print that you can't understand and never read and click through it. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, a, it's you're taking control of your own identity, self sovereign identity now, your own data, and MeWe's letting is now taking a leap and letting their users do that. Huge, huge leap for MeWe to take. So it we're is really a huge leap. Yeah, really impressed by their foresight to do this. Incredible. Now, um, just one more question for you because you know I've been hearing a lot lately about censorship. And I think there's like two minds of it, right? There's people who are 100% free speech oriented. People should be able to say whatever they want to say. And then there are other people who are really glad the governments are stepping up to mm -hmm. fight misinformation, disinformation, all this. So what, what do you do when you have a protocol in a network where you can have unstoppable social networks? That's, you're, you're hitting on one of the hard problems in life, right? The security versus freedom debate. Yeah. Right? How do you have security and freedom? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think anybody... I've ever read is had a, had a 
fundamental answer. It's always we don't have to balance. figure it out today. <laughs> um, but but I think that what we're trying to do is empower um, a more diverse set of communities to, to set their own balance there, as opposed to one monolith. You know, there's these Facebook commercials now with like football fields of people trying to solve the moderation problem, and we just think having one, you know, kind of autocratic regime managing all of our digital lives is that's clearly not a good answer. No. So let's at least at least move to a a model that that has more decentralization of the power structure and better hope of having better outcomes. Obviously, the scope of humanity is vast. You're going to have bad actors and good actors that'll never probably change, but we're hoping that you'll you'll get back to at least we started in the analog world to work out kind of healthy communities in, hmm. in many parts of the world, not all. We're hoping that we'll, we'll foster that same process in the digital world. Fantastic. Well, um, it's very, very nice talking to you today. Uh, thank you for tackling for such me. difficult problems. Yeah. Uh, thank you also for, for bringing all kinds of users into Polkadot. I mean, that'll be really interesting to see how they interact with the users that are already there. Well, thank you, we're excited about it. But everybody out there, we, we need your help. We don't have all the answers for sure. And this kind of project only works if it's a movement. It's not even a coalition, much less a company, much less a person. So we're hoping to get more and more people coming in. And it's open source, obviously. It's we don't we, we're trying to be very inclusive. We welcome new ideas. If you think something's wrong, come on in and help us make it better. You know. So we invite all of you to come in. Okay, dude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully we can talk soon. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.